La universidad es un lugar de innovación, por eso innovación y universidad son la misma cosa. En estudios políticos y relaciones internacionales de la Universidad Francisco Marroquín, los estudiantes son los dueños de su proyecto académico. We've developed incredible curriculum, we've developed incredible outreach. Que es la carrera del futuro de alguien que quiera adentrarse en el apasionante mundo de los estudios políticos con la libertad como eje central. Good night, Europe. And afternoon, the Americas. My name is Will Ogilvie, and I'm the coordinator for global affairs at the Institute for Political Studies and International Relations at the House of Freedom in Guatemala, Francisco Marroquín University. We have been hearing about the withdrawal of troops in Afghanistan for some time now, and I don't think many people were able to pin Afghanistan in the map before 2001. Every now and then we have some comments in the news about the peace process and eventual withdrawal of the United States. But with help of our guest today, we would like to put the past 20 years into perspective. What was the original mission? What did mission accomplished look like back then? What about today? Did the objectives change? How is the peace process looking? And what should the international community be focused on? We have many questions to ask, and hopefully, through an informal conversation with our guests, we might get some answers. Bridget Wagner was kind enough to introduce, us to, uh, to introduce us to James a couple of months back. Bridget is a colleague of James at the Heritage Foundation and is also on the advisory board of Antigua Forum. And to be honest, I've been looking forward to this conversation, and I know that many of uh, my students are online too, and we have been talking about the role of the United States in Afghanistan and the Middle East for quite some time. Dr. James Carafano is a leading expert in national security and foreign policy challenges, an accomplished historian and teacher, as well as a prolific writer and researcher. He currently serves as the Heritage Foundation's first president, foreign and defense policy studies, assuming responsibilities for responsibility for heritage, entire defense and foreign policy team. Carafano is a graduate of the US Military Academy at West Point and served 25 years in the US Army, retiring as a Lieutenant Colonel. He holds a master's degree and doctorate from Georgetown University, as well as a master's degree in strategy from the US Army War College. His recent research has focused on developing the national security required to secure the long-term interests of the United States, protecting the public, providing for economic growth, and preserving civil liberties. James, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. It's Welcome. great to be with you. So James, um, I'm having a seminar, we're doing a seminar with the students on the Middle East and what it's looking like after, you know, it's 10 years after the Arab Spring. And Afghanistan have been, has been popping in and out of the conversation all the time. But um, to start the conversation, I would like to know maybe, and to put the public into perspective, again, to refresh the memory a bit, why did the United States, why did it intervene in Afghanistan? Well, well, you might ask why anybody's in Afghanistan other than the Afghans. And you know, geography is destiny and history. And Afghanistan is, in modern times, uh, is really the gateway between the, the great civilizations of the world. So in the 18th and 19th century, Afghanistan was really the buffer between Imperial Russia and Imperial Britain, which at the time, uh, the jewel in the crown was India, the most important British possession in this empire. And so the, the, the British were in uh, Afghanistan for a simple reason, to secure the front, the Indian frontier. Uh, Afghanistan was also uh, the heartbeat of the, the Silk Road. And so it connected both Asia uh, and the greater Middle East. And so Afghanistan is an issue of, of greater Middle East politics, which is why, for example, Turkey and Iran today have an interest in Afghanistan. So in the India and, and Soviet Russia, after Indian independence, actually had very good relations 
And so Afghanistan really was kind of of lesser importance because you know, the old days of the great, they called the great game had really disappeared because Russia and India were actually friends. But as you get into the latter years of the Cold War, the Russians really worried about that portion of the frontier. And they weren't worried about India. They were worried about Pakistan, uh, which was an ally of the United States, and the weakness of Afghan governance. And in the sense that that would create essentially an, an open flank in, in, uh, in, the, in the Soviet uh, sphere of influence. And so eventually they made a bold move to actually first trying to prop up the Afghan government and then physically invading Afghanistan. And that triggered a very significant uh, insurgent war that uh, was incredibly damaging to the Russians and, and in some ways contributed to the end of the Russian Empire. Part of the group, one of the groups that participated uh, in that conflict was a group called the Taliban. Now, the, the Taliban are ethnically Pashtun. Af Afghanistan is made up of a number of different ethnic groups, and the largest are actually the Pashtun. And what's what's significant about the Pashtuns is if you if you're doing the Middle East, you understand that if you want to talk about the Kurds, well, the Kurds are everywhere, and uh, the Pashtun population actually. Uh, spans both Afghanistan and Pakistan. So there are, there are Pakistan Taliban and there are Afghanistan Taliban. And uh, the, the Taliban were one of the groups uh, that were uh, pushing back against the Russians. Uh, and when the Russians departed, there was a vacuum and an internal civil war. And the, the, in the end, the Taliban won. Uh, now, the, the Taliban are a very fundamentalist Islamist group. They had a very Harsh, probably the harshest uh, interpret most uh, interpretation of Islam that you could possibly imagine. Did things famously, for example, like blowing up historic you know, ancient idols because there were images uh, which were not consistent with the Quran. Um, not letting women uh, be in the marketplace, make sure they're veiled. Not letting um, girls go to school. It was, it was a very, very oppressive rule. So how the United States came into this picture was uh, through a shattering group called the Haqqani Network. Now, the Haqqani is very difficult to describe. They're based in Pakistan. They're criminal, political terrorists. I mean, Haqqani is a family. I think the closest thing to the Haqqani is think of like the mafia. And it was, and they are also a deeply fundamentalist uh, um, organization. It was the Haqqani who really reached out to the Taliban and said, not just creating the links between the Taliban and the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Service, uh, because increasingly Pakistan and India were at odds, and Pakistan looked at Afghanistan as leverage against India. But the Haqqani is also linked to um, veterans of the, of, the, of the Afghan war against the Russians which included people like Osama bin Laden. These are groups that were, were not supported by the United States. Some of them were supported by the, the Pakistan ISI. Some of them were, were supported by funds that they got from Saudi families and, and other families in the Middle East. Um, many of them left Afghanistan with the idea of taking the jihad back to the Middle East. And if you look at the origins of many of the radical movements in the 90s in the Middle East, what they, what they hoped to do was take the veterans who came from the Middle East to fight the jihad against the Russians, take that movement back to the Middle East and overthrow the Saudi government, overthrow the UAE government, overthrow the Kuwaiti government, throw, throw the Israelis into the sea. Um, obviously, none of the governments in the Middle East were super hot on that. Uh, many of them, including Osama bin Laden, fled the country. He, he went to Sudan and, uh, and he was being pursued in the Sudan. It was the Haqqanis who convinced the Taliban that they should hope these, these radical jihadists. And so on that invitation, Al-Qaeda and groups came to Pakistan and under, under the blessing of guests of the Taliban, set up camps and infrastructure to really continue a global Islamist campaign against the West and particularly against the United States. And, and that's where 9-11 was born. Uh, after the 9-11 attacks, and after the United States pinpointed that Osama bin Laden was responsible for directing the terrorist attacks against the United States, the U.S. demanded that the Taliban, 
essentially uh, disengage from the tal from Al Qaeda and and essentially either allow the United States to come in and get Al Qaeda or turn those people over to the United States. The Taliban refused, and that precipitated um, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, did two things: it um, it drove the Taliban out of Afghanistan, um, along with the factions of Al Qaeda. Um, the Al Qaeda factions uh, stayed in Pakistan. Some of them under the cooperation and the cover of some of the people from ISI. The the Taliban uh, went back and forth uh, between fighting against in Afghanistan and going back in Pakistan, linked directly to the heroin trade and the drug trade, which was an integral way to raise revenue to support the ongoing Islamist activities. So many Taliban, for example, Afghan Taliban would would go some winter in, in Quetta, uh, in, in Pakistan. Then they would come back. They would pay people to grow crops. They would arm them and pay them. We called Dollar a Day Taliban, uh, and can continue the war, uh, and then go back and forth. And because they were going back in Pakistan, which is a relative sanctuary, the U.S. military never really achieved the the goal of of stabilizing Afghanistan. So it, over a long occupation, we established an Afghan government. We transitioned from the US military fighting the Taliban to the Afghans uh, fighting the Taliban. And uh, really, I think since really the latter part of President Obama's administration, through the administration of President Donald Trump, we've basically been supporting the government and the people of Afghanistan and essentially fighting this ongoing surgency against the Taliban, coming across from Pakistan, fighting, trying to gain territory, going back, um, relying in part on cooperation of Pakistan intelligence services, in part on a very significant drug trade that allows them to generate a lot of revenue. And this is continued through the Trump administration. And during this period, the U.S. forces have drawn down and down and down. Now we're actually... Uh, a few thousand forces, a number of contractors, mostly there to provide advice and support to the Pakistan, to the Afghanistan military, things that they can't do themselves, like air support, medical assistance, the big logistic things, moving ammunition around, figuring out how to pay people, um, and and supporting the Afghan government. Um, now we're at the point where the United States and we should mention the other NATO countries, because a number of NATO countries came in and supported the United States and have been involved in training missions and other missions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and they are largely leaving uh, as the U.S. Withdraw, with, will withdraw the last of its military forces. So that's where we are now. Before I get into what's going on with the peace process, you, you talked a lot about Pakistan, but I would like to hear a bit more about it because it sounds like a complicated relationship between the United States and Pakistan uh, going in and out. So I understand that Pakistan's tensions with India makes Afghanistan something very interesting for the Pakistanis, but what has their relationship been like? Because for example, bin Laden was found in Pakistan. As, as, uh, okay. So during most of the Cold War, after the, the, the Indian independence, India was really the pioneer of what's called the Third World Movement which you know, we would align neither with the West nor with the Russians. We would kind of stay out of the Cold War. The reality is India actually um, had a, a, a fairly stable strategic partnership with the Russians. Um, governments were fairly socialist and, and actually fairly anti-Western, anti anti-colonial, anti-imperialist. Um, and so the United States did not have a very close relationship with India. In contrast, the United States had a fairly close relationship with Pakistan. What um, kind of shifted that dynamics was two things. One is the Cold War came to an end. Um, and the other is both those countries became nuclear powers. Mm -hmm. And um, that put the United States in a more difficult position because it didn't approve of proliferation at all. Um, and uh, and India, you know, in a sense, was no longer the 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 the, the nine aligned movement ended. Um, 
So India wasn't necessarily antithetical to the U.S. anymore. Um, and, you know, the United States found itself going from pro-Pakistan and kind of not friends with India to kind of balancing between Pakistan and India to actually today, um, largely because of China, the U.S. is a very strong tr strategic relationship with India because India has shifted from this is no longer about the Pakistan India competition mm -hmm. where the United States re really tried to kind of balance both powers to where India has shifted that their ma main strategic concern is really China and even Pakistan they really see that as an extension of the China threat uh, and um, they uh, they they see Pakistan increasingly subordinate to to China and so they see potentially an avenue of threat um, from Pakistan using Afghanistan, much in the way Pakistan uses the Kashmir to kind of ratchet up and down tensions that uh, a Taliban in, in Afghanistan or, or a, you know, a failed state in Afghanistan could be another route that Pakistan could potentially push destabilizing influence into India. And so you raise a really good point because the reason why we're in Afghanistan has really changed. Initially, we went into Afghanistan to dismantle the terrorist infrastructure and to create conditions that you would never see the resurgence of another tank terrorist sanctuary again. Mm -hmm. Now, that's still a relatively important mission for the United States because we've seen what happens when radical groups can essentially set up sanctuaries where they can direct operations, they can pull in foreign fighters, they can attract financing, they can direct foreign operations. We've seen this in Afghanistan. We also saw it with ISIS in Syria and Iraq. We've seen it in Libya. And so mm -hmm. I think there's a general notion as, as an element of US foreign policy that allowing people to have an unrestricted terrorist sanctuary is not a good idea. So there is some of that in, in, in current US concern. But the real animating force of US concern today is we want a stable and secure India because a stable and secure India is an important partner for us in dealing with China. So okay. uh, 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 an, a bad Afghanistan situation that's destabilizing these creating problems for India isn't good for us. The other thing is, is the United States still maintains a relationship with Pakistan, um, and we always will. And, and in some ways, the Indians want that because the Indians and Pakistanis, essentially, neither one of them really want to escalate. Uh, it, and, and they really kind of need the U.S. as that, that buffering partner. So th this is the irony of great power politics. So, so the example of the thing is, you know, a hundred years ago, Russia was the great, you know, 200 years ago, Russia was the great threat. Nobody thought about China. Um, and then we went to Russia is India's friend. And, uh, and now um, the Indians are largely indifferent to the Russians, but they're really worried about, about um, the Chinese. Yeah, the, 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 I also want to shift maybe a bit more northward because if counterterrorism is still an objective, um, in a way, isn't that an objective shared with other, you know, um, competitive great powers like China and Russia? I mean, the Chinese are really having a r very harsh treatment with the Uyghurs and are very scared also, I feel and I think, of um, Islamist terrorism in general. So are the Russians. So in a way, couldn't there be, before we get into the internal politics of Afghanistan, which I know they're very complicated, what would a great power bargain be like? Or how would everyone win with a peace settlement in Afghanistan? Yeah, well, I, I don't really see a peace settlement based around the, the threat of global terrorism because the, the reality is the Russians, the West and the Chinese see that very differently. So the Russians are deeply concerned about the Uyghurs. These are eth an ethnic group, large ethnic group in China who practice the, um, the religion of Islam and who there is a record of, of history of some insurgent movement among the Uyghurs. That's going back decades and for reasons because they're oppressed. Um, mm -hmm. 
that the, the Chinese are incredibly concerned about any threat of internal domestic unrest, and they move violently and vigorously to suppress that. And so the Uyghurs, to the point of they're willing to risk the hate of the world for you know committing a genocide if if it allows them to secure internal domestic politics. So there has not been a lot of interest from radical Islamic groups uh, for support for the Uyghurs. That mm -hmm. it, it's just a fact. So the Chinese don't really see a problem with dealing with the Taliban, even if they reconnect with Al-Qaeda, because nobody's turning the global Islamist movement, uh, radical Islamist movement towards China. They're mm -hmm. turning it towards the West. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the, the Russians obviously have Chechnya and everything else, but but the 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 rebels in Chechnya and other places have always been very reticent or reluctant to connect with Al Qaeda and ISIS and other and they, they've always been independent. So and the Russians deal with them really as a separate group. So again, the Russians really aren't worried about the Taliban linking up with the Chechens and coming after them. So it sounds like, well, we all hate global terrorism, so shouldn't we all be working for a stable Afghanistan? The point is, is the, the Russians and the Chinese aren't worried about the Haqqani network and, and the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. It's not, it's not their problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how is the balance of power looking like in Afghanistan now between the tensions between uh, the Taliban and the Afghan government? Well, I, I think this is the great question. So the United States was really the only great power with sufficient interest and capability to go in and really balance things. Now, the United States could never solve the problem of the Taliban because, because the Taliban can always go back to Pakistan. And you know th this is actually very analogous to the reason why the United States could never ultimately win the war in Vietnam. Because the Viet Cong and the North Vietnam Army could always retreat to North Vietnam, and we were willing to bomb Vietnam, North Vietnam, but we were never willing to invade it. And, mm -hmm. and the Chinese and the Russians were always willing to support the North Vietnamese to keep them in the war because it was bad for us. So in a sense, it was an endless war. So in, at the end, we adopted the policy of, look, well, we can't win this war. What we'll do is we'll we will arm and equip the South Vietnamese so they can defend themselves. That actually worked, but then we withdrew our support in 1975 and the, the South Vietnamese collapsed. Mm -hmm. So the, what we're trying to do in Afghanistan is, was a similar strategy, which was we, don't know, we, we can't win this war, even though we're a great power, because we're not going to invade Pakistan, because that would just buy even more problems. But what we can do is we can put enough capability and force in there to keep hold to keep the Afghans from falling apart, and we did that. But the question is now, what will we do in the future? And the situation now is, look, the Russians are not going to move in; they they don't have an interest in doing it. The Chinese are not going to move in; the Indians are not going to move in. And so, what you presently have is a bunch of different factions in Afghanistan kind of weighing their options and figuring out what kind of deals we, we could make. So there's just a lot of deal making going on. Um, some people saying, should I side with the Afghan government? Should I cut a deal with the Taliban? Even people in the Afghan government are looking at cutting a deal with the Taliban. And of course, the problem is, is when you say the Taliban, it, it is not like it was um, on 9-11, where it was a politically unified group with a clear structure. I mean, the Taliban are, are, are somewhat fragmented. So mm -hmm. the, the Afghan Taliban uh, are um, a coalition which may or may not hold together. Uh, and so nobody, nobody really knows what the future holds, if we're going to have another winner-take-all civil war or if they'll divide the country up into pieces. Uh, nobody's really sure of that. Nobody's sure what the U.S. is going to do to continue to support that. And i, I got to be honest with you, I'm not even sure in the United States if we – have fully decided what we're going to um, do going forward. What's interesting is, is is the tipping point here is not necessarily the U.S. military. We are way past the point where the U.S. military can defend Afghanistan. We have, we have a few thousand troops in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. 
we spend less in Afghanistan today in a year than just a few years ago we spent in a week. So our actual physical footprint on the ground is fairly modest. The, the big change is, is how much support will the United States continue to invest in the future? And, and that's kind of the open question. So the incentive, even if the Taliban are fragmented at the moment, the incentive for them is not to cause, not to cause too much trouble to the Americans that might trigger another or more aggressive uh, deployment of troops. Um, get you know softly the Americans out and see what happens with the government. And yeah, them. I mean, look, there's no danger of kind of the Americans stepping back in with a heavy hand. Okay. That that's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. the, the the Afghan greater challenge is how can we keep the Americans engaged? Uh, and if we can't keep the Americans engaged, what kind of deal can we cut to continue to survive into the future? Okay. So, I mean, you talked about Vietnam, and if I'm not mistaken, please correct me, James, if I'm mistaken, but Kennedy spent a lot of effort trying to state build uh, South Vietnam um, and give sort of a coherent political organization to help with all of that so it could defend itself from the North, basically, if, if I'm not mistaken. How, how will this be different, though, if, if, we, if, if, if it's just going to be the Afghan government and the balance of power is not really in their favor? How will that not happen? Yeah. State building is, is very, very difficult without mm -hmm. physical security. Um, if you want to go back to another example, if look at Western Europe after um, World War II. Western Europe was completely devastated. Um, but there, there really was no post-war resistance. I mean, the, the Nazis even had this big program called Werewolves. They were going to continue an insurgent campaign. That just evaporated. So there was no real, other than lack of governance and starvation and you know, crime, there, there wasn't a, a really internal physical security threat. So once that basic physical security threat had been met, um, you could start nation building. And the Russians really didn't, start to press Western Europe until like 1948 because the Russians really spent between 45 and 48 consolidating their control over Central Europe. So there was a span of time there where Europe could actually rebuild because it didn't have that public safety threat and didn't have that external pressure. Um, and, and so Europe, Europe recovered. If you look at Colombia, for example, um, once the, the narco civil war ended, Colombia made dramatic advances. Um, Colombia is actually moving backwards today, and it's and it's because the public safety situation has deteriorated significantly, in large part because of external sponsors kind of throwing fuel on the fire. So the the problem with Afghan nation building is, without a continued influx of support for the physical security. It, it's very likely to stop and very quickly reverse. You know, everybody focuses on the military and everything else, but actually, if you look at Afghanistan the last couple of years, despite the challenges of governance and everything else, their, their economies actually made remarkable growth. The, the number of children going to school has dramatically risen. Mm -hmm. Safety in communities has actually dramatically risen. The, the, you, the, the Afghans, the Afghan government, controlled way more territory today than they did um, after after the the uh, Taliban were expelled after 9-11. So Af Afghanistan was building as a nation, but when you have an ongoing threat to physical security, unless you've got a counter to that, it's very difficult to see how that will sustain the it's really hard to rebuild a country in the middle of violence. That's just the reality of it. That's understandable. I wanted to ask also, maybe not just in, in, the, in the conversation about Afghanistan, but I know that you've written, um, you've written a book on the role of private contractors. And I don't think that's very well known to the public, what they do, exactly how that works. Are they effective? Could you tell us maybe a bit about that? Could that also be maybe a middle-term solution to help the Afghan government? 
And the, the short answer is, is it depends on who the contractors work for. Um, so uh, violence has, has really been, for most of human history, a private sector activity. If you think back to the Middle Ages, for example, if a king wanted to go to war, the first thing he'd have to do is go to a duke and ask him if he'd give him men. And then he'd have to go to Italy and borrow money to pay for the campaign. And then he, and governments actually had very little capacity to wage war. And, and most, most of the capacity capability was really from the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, it really was with the process of state formation in the 18th and 19th century that states really gathered all the capabilities and infrastructures to really be the, the purveyor of violence, and even that we've always had contractors on the battlefield. So the most famous battle in American history in the American Civil War is probably the Battle of Gettysburg. If you were at the Battle of Gettysburg, everybody hauling the ammunition was a contractor. Everybody bringing up the hay for the horses was a contractor. So we've always had, even in modern times, we've always had contractors on the battlefield and doing all kinds of governance. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Intelligence Service during the Civil War was the Pinkerton Detective Agency. We literally, we didn't have a CIA and FBI back then. We literally hired a detective agency to gather strategic intelligence. So there have always been contractors there. What's what's happened, I think, in the 20, 20th and 21st century is the global private sector has developed so much that we've actually developed a lot of capabilities to do the kinds of things that only governments can do in the 18th and 19th century. And so... Um, Contractors have returned to the battlefield. Um, most famously, the early phase was really in Africa, and it was in the, the post-colonial, post-Cold War era where um, the post-colonial powers had collapsed, um, the Soviet Union had collapsed, so there really wasn't any, any great power struggle in Russia, and the quickest way to bring capability was essentially to hire contractors. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were hiring a lot of contractors from a lot of different places. There was a lot of people left over the Cold War that needed a job. And a lot of that was um, kind of crazy Wild West kind of stuff. It, it wasn't governed. Um, and they're not actually mercenaries. I mean, mercenaries, the term mercenary actually means um, a private person who's not subject to a party of the conflict. So if a government hires you, you're not a mercenary, you're a contractor. Mm -hmm. um, so most of these guys were not mercenaries, they were actually contractors. So what happened is um, that kind of ended uh, and we're, we're, uh, we, we're really seeing a big expansion of contractors is as the United States and other great military powers kind of stood down after the Cold War, it, a lot of it found it was cheaper to buy additional capability by just hiring contractors. So this has been something that's really been going on even actually before the end of the war in Vietnam, where now instead of, you know, if you think of the Gulf War, where we, to, to mobilize the military for the Gulf War, we would have had to do something on, on the order that we did to raise the military for World War II. Mm -hmm. Rather than did that, we just really just hired a bunch of contractors. Um, because it, it was faster and cheaper. Yeah. Today, we're in really a new phase where we're seeing a lot of contractors from a lot of parties, um, again, in areas of failed state and conflict. And a lot of these are Russian, um, Chinese, um, some Middle East, Iranian. And these guys are not playing by the rules. So um, we're largely, I would say, where you know, the United States... Great Britain, Western Europe, um, Western countries are employing military contractors on the battlefield. They're they're adhering to the rule of law. They're you know following lawful orders. They're doing appropriate things. Where we're really seeing kind of scary stuff is from countries like Russia and China and others who are employing mercenaries and not really adhering to the rule of law. So and, and it's, not, it's not really the fighters per se, but the contractors that can be scary because they come in with no rules, basically. So it they are not just playing for them, basically. It depends on whose contractors they are. Yeah. Okay. I mean, largely a lot of the criticism about U.S. contractors during in, in the Second Iraq War, which you know started a lot of this concern about contractors in combat, mm -hmm. 
there were, I mean, there were things that were done wrong. There's no question about that. But when you look at the scale and the scope of the mobilization, and everything else, you can kind of understand that. But by and large, U.S. contractors were, you know, followed law for orders and everything else. And, there were, and it was a lot of, there was a lot of politics involved in that. And the, and the proof that I have that there were a lot of politics involved in that, it's when when the when Bush was voted out of office, and the the other political party took over, mm -hmm. you had the same companies doing the same thing they were doing under President Bush, but nobody was complaining about you know unaccountable contractors anymore. But we do have a problem with contractors in, in combat in the world today, and, and it is with countries who, who are literally employing people who are not following the rule of law. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you think that could be a maybe short slash middle term help for the Afghan government? Well, it could it could be a help, and it could be a problem. It depends on who who hires the contractors. Mm -hmm. If the United States is paying contractors to continue to help and support the Afghan military people. That, that, that could be a stabilizing factor. Um, and I would actually argue that if you look at what the United States has been doing the last 24 months, that's what's really providing stability. The, the, two, the few thousand American troops that are there are not, they're just providing advice and support. It's the contractors that are doing all the logistical and everything else. So that actually in many ways is the more important piece. Um, but if the United States withdraw those, I think that's a problem. Um, those companies may not stay if they're not going to be able to operate in a safe and secure environment. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Um, the other thing is, is even though I don't think China, Russia, or India are going to try to take over Afghanistan or Pakistan, they're all happy to try to promote themselves. And you could see contractors or mercenaries being introduced by, 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 by various countries trying to support one warlord or, or left, and it could really exacerbate the, the pace of conflict. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, one of three things is, well, one of two things is going to happen. One is the Afghan, Afghanistan is going to muddle through, and we will have something akin to the current status quo, which will just go on forever. The other one is is the thing, whole thing melts down, and it's, it's not very pretty. And there'll be some foreign interventions. For example, the Iranians will intervene to protect because they're ethnic people of Iranian descent in Afghanistan. They'll do some stuff. The Turks might do some stuff. The Russians, the Chinese, even the Indians might do some stuff. Nobody's going to do enough to take over the whole country. They'll, they'll do enough to take the little piece. So it could be one of the most consequential failed states of, of, the, of the new century, or it could just muddle along. Um, I, I, at this point, I'm, I'm not... I'm not sure which will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it's nearly a, a, an impossibility to not have the Taliban in agreement with the government if you want a peace agreement. Yeah, and if you want a peace agreement. But, but there's two things there. One is, can you survive as a country without a peace agreement? Mm. I think what we've demonstrated the last five or six years is yes, as long as you can provide basic public safety basic governance to the Afghan people. You can have an ongoing, call it a forever war if you want. You can have an ongoing conflict forever and you can still get by if you can if you can provide a modicum of public safety and a modicum of governance. Um, the other thing is, is, is there such a thing as a, a, a deal between the Taliban uh, and the other warlords? Um, I, I don't know if that's actually feasible. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the, the Taliban will accept it. I don't, I don't think they would, actually. I, I don't think they'd... The problem with the power sharing agreement is twofold. One is you're always worried that that's fine today, but what happens tomorrow? Right? Are you willing to live with this kind of balance? It's like if the, the Normans and the Saxons, you know, are you willing to live like that? Um, and... And the other one is, is there, there is a fundamental ideological disconnect. I mean, the Taliban are still committed to a very radical, fundamental belief system that doesn't allow women to go to work, doesn't allow girls to go to school, you know, you know doesn't allow basic human rights. And, uh, and, and of course, even though they don't believe in drugs because that's against the religion of Islam, they're happy to be the world's most you know, productive drug trader. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So I'm going to be starting with the 
with the questions um, that, that are coming through YouTube and Facebook. Please, um, everyone who's watching from home, um, we're open now on our Q&A, so I'll be launching James any other questions you'd like to ask him here. I think what we should do is, well, you should take all the hard questions. <laughs> I'll, I'll take all the... No, no, I'm learning too much to talk. I'd rather listen. <laughs> Good, thanks. Okay, so one of... Okay, Estefania is asking through Facebook, how does the withdrawal from Afghanistan impact the military? Yeah, the point is, the answer is not much. Um, our deployment in Afghanistan is now down to a few thousand soldiers. Um, so in terms of global military commitments, it's it's not a lot. Um, it, it Particularly people say, well, we need to focus on China. Well, moving a couple of thousand U.S. soldiers around, you know, in the vastness of the Asia Pacific theater isn't going to really accomplish much of anything. So um, it's, it is, uh, and the costs are significantly down. I mean, the op there was a time when, when Afghanistan was sucking a lot of the military's cash and you could buy planes and you can, you know, but that's, this is, this is not a big commitment. Matter of fact, if you, we actually, the casualties in Afghanistan today are probably less than other theaters have in training accidents. In other words, more people are probably dying from training accidents in other theaters that are dying from combat in Afghanistan. Um, the, the, uh, the, the U.S. has probably proportional military commitments all over the world if you look at troops you have in Latin America and African places. So it's, it's in and itself is not going to free up a ton of resources and in and of itself isn't really costing the U.S. military and the U.S. taxpayers all that much. So the notion that somehow disengaging from this is allowing the U.S. flexibility to deal with other things, that's probably not, not really true. And the, the converse actually is if you walk away and it becomes a big regional problem, then then you're actually, you know, you know it's like the person that, you know, didn't take all their antibiotics, right? And... Uh, you know, and then the disease came raging back, right? It's a bigger problem if they just finished their, their, their antibiotic. Or... Mm -hmm. And James, I want, I also wanted to ask you a question regarding how you see the role of the United States in the Middle East in general, not just if we zoom out a bit of Afghanistan. Um, Obama was very famous with all the pivot to Asia and uh, the new theaters and everything that's going on in the Indo Pacific. But what do you see? Has that changed in the last 10 years for the United States? No, I mean, I think the reality is the United States is a global power with global interests and global responsibilities. I mean, I don't think anybody in America thinks we're really the world's policemen or the world's babysitter or anything else. But the reality is, is we have very significant interests all over the world. And we either have to be able to get there to defend those interests or be there. Um, or to have influence. And, and if you think about it, what what knits the United States to the rest of the world and actually kind of what, what knits the entire planet together is Western Europe, the greater Middle East, and the Indo-Pacific. These are the giant lily pads uh, and, and, the, and the commons that connect them, everything from the Suez Canal to the you know, Straits of Malacca. The, this is the giant rubber band that kind of holds the whole world together. And so what's really in the best interest of the United States is that all three of those regions are relatively peaceful and stable because that just makes life easy for us. It's, mm -hmm. it's like the, you know, if you in, in early America, if you were having a train, it'd be great if the train never had to go through Indian country, right? That if every place the train went from New York to California was relatively peaceful and stable, then you could do, you know, commerce and everything else, you know, effortlessly. Um, so although you hear many people in the United States, so we need to pivot to Asia, we need to pivot to dealing with China. There's two problems with that. One is China's influence is actually global. So saying we need to, you know, focus on China. So we all need to go to Asia. is kind of saying like, we all need to go to the bank after the bank robbers already left the bank, right? China's everywhere, 
So dealing with China is really a global problem, and you can't deal with it just by being in the Indo-Pacific. And the other thing is, is, is you still need to have a stable Europe, and you still need to have a stable Middle East. It's like the guy that goes to the doctor and says, the doctor goes, you have cancer and a brain tumor and a bad heart. Which one would you like me to fix? And well, you're like, you know, can I live without the other two? And the doctor goes, well, no, right? So, I mean, we can't really, America can't really rest at peace in the world without a stable, a stable um, Middle East, a stable Western Europe and a stable Indo-Pacific. And in this respect, Afghanistan is actually uh, potentially impacting on two of the three potentially can impact on the stability of, of the greater Middle East and definitely can impact on the stability of South Asia. And given the increasing importance of India and global affairs, I mean, that'll have a ripple uh, effect across the region, if not the whole world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, more questions coming in. You're doing nicely, James. You don't need my help at all. <laughs> so Lisa's asking on Facebook, what are the costs and benefit of the withdrawal of the U of the U.S. troops. Um, you know, I I don't really see a lot of benefits um, unless you're. Already, it's not so expensive, as you're saying. That's why yeah, it's I'm not. Saying. It's not really very expensive to be there, to be honest. In in turn, for what you get, which is not a terrorist sanctuary, not destabilizing the region. I guess I could understand the withdrawal if your notion is this thing's going going to collapse regardless of whether we're there or not. You know, we're just getting out before it collapses. Um, if that's true, then my response to that be, well, you know, that's like saying, you know, the, you know, the house is on fire. You know, I, I don't want to send the fire department. Well, what else are you going to do? Because you're, not, you're going to lose the house, right? So we ought to be doing something that, if we really think that Afghanistan is going to collapse, we, we should have been. Doing, we should be doing something else to make sure it doesn't. If your answer is, uh, on the other hand, I think um, the risks are, are I think the, the the single largest risk is, is this is going to produce significant instability in South Asia, and and it's going to cause a lot more tensions tensions between the Indians and the Chinese, the Indians and the Pakistan. Uh, potentially the Russians and, and perhaps the Chinese. The the one wild card is I think you know if right now the only thing that Russia, China, and Pakistan have in common is they all want the U.S. to leave because they all think it's good for them. That assumption is that the Taliban are going to do stuff that are going to make them happy, which may or may not be true. Um, and they may find the Taliban's actually a bigger headache um, than a benefit to them. So I, I think the all the benefits, the status, I think the status quo in Afghanistan today was a great benefit to the United States. And I'm, I'm like, why are you messing with the status quo if the status quo is actually giving something you want? It's like, why are you waking up the sleeping baby? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to wake him up and maybe he'll be happy and play with me. He might. He also might scream his head off. Like, why are you messing with the status quo? Okay. Okay. Um, if Afghanistan is no longer a terrorist haven at the moment, is Pakistan? Well, it's not. Here's the difference. Um, there's a difference between being a, a haven for terrorists and being a platform and a sanctuary for terrorists. The problem with Afghanistan was that Bin Laden was using it really to run a global network. I mean, similarly with the problem with ISIS. I mean, you had tens of thousands of foreign fighters coming from all over the world going in there. They weren't going to stay there forever. They were going to send those guys back out again and go all over the world. So, look, I mean, I mean, I think a bunch of terrorists running around Pakistan is is a, a tall is a manageable problem. It's, but if, if it becomes a base of operations where people can do training, logistics, resources, and start doing global operations, that's the, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I think we're more or less done. I had a couple more questions, but we, we can leave it here for next time, James. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for joining us today at the UFM.
I hope we can collaborate in the future and maybe organize some other conversations with the students also. Um, and on that regard, I also want to thank everyone at home who's watching us. Um, you can follow us, if all of you who are watching from home, you can look at the rest of our activities that we're organizing at opri.ufm.edu. And also we have, that would be our Instagram down in the bottom left, that's epri uh, at ufm and ufm.epri. Uh, so we're there for, for other events, happy to talk. And James, well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you for having me. And, and thanks for everybody's interest in human affairs. I mean, this is how we get a better world, right? We all think about really difficult problems and how to deal with them. So thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Antigua is such an amazing and special place. An absolutely beautiful location. We're outside in nature. Han sido dos días en los que hemos dado un, un repaso a todo lo que es la Marroquín y también un repaso a todo lo que creemos que debería ser. The co-creation forum is, I think, the perfect instrument for achieving true freedom of the exchange of ideas and increasing the knowledge that we have. Hay que estar abiertos al descubrimiento de nuevas ideas. En estudios políticos y relaciones internacionales de la Universidad Francisco Marroquín, los estudiantes son los dueños de su proyecto académico. Cuando uno agrega más mentes al proceso, uno sale enriquecido porque descubre métodos que, que no hubiese pensado por sí solo. Ha sido una apasionante experiencia de co-creación y co-creatividad en la que personas de diferentes partes del mundo venían a crear la carrera del futuro. 67 participantes pensando en el futuro de EPRI. It's a really interesting opportunity to engage with people in a sort of bottom-up way to ask and try to provide some answers to important questions about education and society. My expectations were actually superseded by reality, that the reality actually worked a lot better. La universidad es un lugar de innovación. En cuanto deja de ser un lugar de innovación, deja de ser universidad. Por eso innovación y universidad son la misma cosa. This event is putting Francisco Marroquín and the networks of scholars in Guatemala, students who are on the international map. The future is very bright for EPRI and very bright for UFM.